Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Many are still in shock following a mass shooting at a condo complex north of Toronto, which leaves six people dead, including the shooter. Both payroll taxes and the carbon tax are going up. We hear from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation about how much it will impact you. And the Salvation Army's Christmas campaigns are hurting. We hear how less donations are coming in this year as we inch closer to Christmas Day. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The Canadian press is reporting that the man suspected of killing five people in a high-rise condominium north of Toronto in the community of Vaughan on Sunday was 73-year-old Francesco Villi. Ontario Special Investigations Unit is not confirming the name, but says the shooter used a semi-automatic handgun and the police found victims in units on different floors. The SIU says the suspect, who was shot and killed by police, lived in the building. Ontario's education minister says his community is visibly shaken by this tragedy. Uh, it's all those who have been impacted in, in, Vaughan, uh, in the community in my riding. Uh, please know that our government stands with you uh, and the community stands with you. We all grieve with you during this uh, most disturbing uh, shooting that's happened in the heart of our community. I want to thank our police and our first responders who were present uh, on the line responding to this unspeakable moment. Um, and also for the work they did to save lives. A sixth victim from the shooting was taken to hospital and is expected to make a full recovery. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation released its annual New Year's Tax Changes Report to highlight some major tax changes coming our way in 2023. Now to talk about this in more detail is the federal director of the CTF, Franco Terrazano, who joins us now from Ottawa. Franco, it appears as though we'll be paying more to both a Canada pension plan and employment insurance tax? Unfortunately, that's correct. Um, if you're making $67,000 or more, your payroll tax bill in 2023 is going up by about $300. Dollars, But, you know, that increase actually downplays just how painful payroll taxes are going to be in 2023. In total, the payroll tax bill for a middle class worker is going to be about $4,700 in 2023. So thousands of dollars taken by the government through these payroll taxes. Now, on April 1st and July 1st of next year, the federal carbon tax will also be going up by quite a bit as well. How much are we talking about here? Yeah, I mean, the Trudeau government continues to raise gas prices and heating bills with its carbon tax hikes. Come April 1, the Trudeau government's carbon tax will cost 14 cents per litre of gasoline. Now, the Trudeau government claims that its carbon tax and rebate scheme makes families better off, but the parliamentary budget officer shows that that is incorrect. According to the PBO, the carbon tax will cost the average family about $847 in 2023, even after the rebates. Now, the government of Alberta is also providing some much needed relief. Let's just chat a bit about that. Well, kudos to Alberta Premier Danielle Smith, because as Trudeau raises the price at the pumps, Premier Smith is providing some relief. She has suspended uh, gas taxes, so that is, is, is welcome news to Alberta drivers. But the Alberta government is also ending the sneaky backdoor income tax grab known as bracket creep. So that could provide relief uh, to Albertans averaging about 300 bucks. Thanks so much, Franco. That was Franco Terrazano, Federal Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, joining us from Ottawa. Alberta Deputy Premier and Infrastructure Minister Nathan Newdorf says the province is trying to make life a little more affordable for Albertans during these very difficult times. Minister Newdorf listed off some of that much-needed help. There is the fuel tax relief program that uh, for six months there will be no provincial fuel tax at the price of the pumps. That will help all Albertans that drive. There's an electricity rebate which has already provided up to $250 of relief uh, to 1.9 million families, small businesses and farms. Uh, so that's a great piece for anybody paying for electricity. There's a natural gas rebate. Uh, there's additional money coming for the utilities. We are re-indexing AISH, PDD, income support, seniors benefit, child tax and family benefits, and your personal income tax. Deputy Premier Nathan Newdorf will have more on some of the much-needed help the province is providing to Albertans. That's coming up 
after business news. Premier Daniel Smith says the need for her newly named parliamentary secretary for civil liberties became apparent during the recent fall session. Grand Prairie MLA Tracy Allard was appointed to the post last Tuesday. Smith says when her government introduced a bill to abolish squatters' rights, questions arose on what more could be done to protect private property rights. She also says the UCP is concerned about campus free speech and whether legislation is needed to preserve people's right to speak their minds openly and freely on campuses. Ten months after the U.S. port entry at Coots was closed due to a protest and blockade, things remain a little chilly between the residents there. The village's mayor says there's still a deep divide between those who supported the protesters and those who did not. Leaving Coots was, um, it, it, you know, we, we all left. The reasons why we left, I've spoken on many, many times. And that message is still crystal clear. Um, and that is we were there as peaceful protesters to hold our government to account. We were standing up against the tyranny that was coming upon us. The border was closed when we got there. We were protesting that it was illegally closed. We wanted that border open. Are they trying to send a message that no more protesting in the future? Is that what it's about? Well, I feel we're going to win either way. If, if, we, if we lose in court, there'll be a, there'll be a civil unrest in our, in our province, in our country. There's that uh, undercurrent of, uh, oh, you're on that side and I'm on this side still, and there are the people who had their opinions about vaccinations and, and whether it's right or wrong and you can't tell me what to do and all of that, they're still there and they still have the same views. Where I used to be able to walk down the street and wave at everybody and they wave back, now I, I don't get all the waves I used to get. It's a good place, it's a good part of the world to be in, and uh, there's a lot going for it. I uh, can sit here and watch the seasons change in the fields and watch the harvest and, and all that and pretend that none of this ever happened. The Canadian Press News Story of the Year is the Freedom Convoy protests in Ottawa at Coots and other border crossings around the country. It was the choice of 41% of TV and radio news directors and print editors who took part in that cross-country survey. Strain on the public health care system was the second choice. Well, right now, a lot of us here have been talking about the weather, especially across much of southwestern Alberta. An extreme cold warning was issued by Environment Canada for Lethbridge. Windchill Valley is close to minus 40. Jeanette Rocher is now with an early peek at the forecast. Jeanette, plugging in our vehicles will be the norm for much of this week. Yes, for sure, Hal. Unless you're like me, who never plugs in my car, I do have a really good battery, but I might have to take up that practice this week, considering the ridiculously cold temperatures that we are uh, having. Okay, so into this evening, we are looking at a slight chance of flurries. Same thing for Tuesday, looking at another two to four centimeters of snow. Overnight low, minus 28, but minus 37 with that wind chill. Tuesday, looking at a high of minus 26 only, and of course, minus 37 with the wind chill. Uh, risk of frostbite for both tonight and tomorrow. That extreme cold sticking around for the rest of the week, but will it be here for Christmas? Well, I'll be back later on in the show to tell you more. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Jeanette. According to Canadian Blood Services, more than 25,000 appointments need to be filled before the end of the year for blood and plasma donations in Canada. Officials from the organization say six out of ten eligible donors believe donating during the Christmas holidays is vital, but only one in ten are planning to book before December 31st. A nursing student from Lethbridge College is doing her part as she recruited 30 plasma donors. For her efforts, she won a $3,000 bursary. When I was going around um, kind of getting as many people to come donate plasma as possible. It was really interesting to me, all these individuals who voiced great interest in doing it, but had never done it before just because they hadn't been pushed to, or they didn't really understand how, or the process was like a little bit foreign. So they really wanted someone to go with. So I think that was kind of cool is um, I felt like I was able to kind of bridge the gap between the need and then also helping those people find a way that they felt like they could contribute. Canadian Blood Services says the number of people who donate regularly has decreased by 31,000 since the beginning of the pandemic. There are more than 720 plasma appointments that still need to be filled at the Lethbridge Plasma Donor Centre by December 31st. The Salvation Army is a Christian-run organization which helps support vulnerable people in 400 communities in Canada. Now here in Lethbridge, 
The final push for the Army's Christmas Kettle and Toys for Tots campaigns is in full swing. Video journalist Micah Quinn chatted with staff from the nonprofit who say they're well below their goal for each program and are in dire need of donations as Christmas Day fast approaches. The Salvation Army has been doing Christmas kettles across the country for well, the better part of 100 or so plus years. Major Donald Bladen, the Community Ministries Officer for the Lethbridge Salvation Army, says the organization is struggling to find volunteers for the Christmas Kettle Campaign. The goal for this year is to raise $150,000 and Bladen explained that donations are down. We would be lucky to be at about $70,000 right now. We also do a Christmas uh, mail out and the Christmas mail out uh, goal is uh, also $100,000 and we're pretty close to reaching that at this point. Bladen says all of the funding for the Christmas Kettle Campaign will stay right here in Lethbridge. You know, January, February, you know, all the way through the summer months and leading up to the fall, uh, the monies that come in now help sustain the ministries that we do. And so we do food distribution twice a week. We provide uh, all kinds of practical assistance to people that uh, come to us with various needs. And of course, we can't do it all, and so we do referrals. We do a Pathway of Hope program, which helps people set goals and achieve goals in their personal lives, which really is meant to target the poverty issue. Catherine Kuzminski, a worker with the Lethbridge Salvation Army, says the Toys for Tots campaign provides provides special gifts to around 1,000 children whose families are struggling during the Christmas season. She says toy donations are down, with the demand continuing to rise. The balance is really off this year. Um, within our Christmas Hope um, partnership, we're finding that all of our organizations are really stressed, trying to fit the need and um, keep up with the toy demands. For more information or to donate, you can visit LethbridgeSalvationArmy.ca. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Lethbridge police are in their second week of their annual Christmas check stop campaign. Officials say it's going quite well so far, as most drivers have been complying with the laws. Sergeant Danny Lomnes says a total of 10 vehicles have been seized so far. He says campaigns like this one are important to bring about awareness. We got to bring awareness to the community and uh, to the citizens. Um, you know, to ensure that they know that we do care about, you know, everybody on the road, uh, pedestrians, you know, bicyclists, obviously it's, it's bad weather right now, but, uh, um, you know, we do have a, a job to, you know, ensure everybody is safe to and from uh, wherever they're going. Sergeant Lomnes says the holiday Christmas season campaign will run until early January. Social agencies and advocates say rising interest rates and high inflation are hitting the disadvantaged in our country very hard. Food bank usage is on the rise, and many of our homeless are having a difficult time making ends meet, including in Calgary. The demand for our program has only increased in a short period of time, um, and the, the needs that folks have in a way that um, like, will run out of resources. If, if we had more supplies, we would be going all night long. We just don't have enough for, for the need out here. Well, anything that we budgeted for last year is, you know, completely out the door now. I mean, everything we buy as a program is, is costs us a lot more. Everything has gone up in price, whether it's uh, the snacks for bagged lunches, the tarps that we're purchasing, socks, um, meal replacement, just generally everything. Our, our budget we made last year is doesn't exist anymore. What worries me the most is we have thousands of people waiting on a housing list with zero places to house people. We have rent going up drastically, um, inflation, and then interest rates on, on being increased by Bank of Canada. And so when people default on their mortgages, where are they going to go? They're going to go to the rental market with more resources to compete than people that are in the rental market and they're going to push more people into poverty. Two Alberta towns are joining forces to become one. Starting on January 1st, Black Diamond and Turner Valley will become Diamond Valley. The possibility of joining the towns has been talked about for quite some time, but following feedback from community members, both councils supported the amalgamation. Residents of both communities will have to get new licenses for their pets, update their driver's licenses, vehicle registrations, and their passports. Diamond Valley will also have a new mayor and six new town councillors who will be sworn in on January the 9th. Federal Treasury Board President Mona Fortier says federal public servants will soon have to return to in-person office work two to three days a week. She also says that the hybrid model is here to stay. 
What's important again, how do we best serve Canadians? That's our objective. We had been forced to work by necessity at home for many years, uh, for, for during COVID, sorry. And now we're adapting a hybrid by design model. We are looking on how we can best serve Canadians and organizations will uh, make sure, of course, that they have the appropriate um, uh, spaces for the employees to uh, work and deliver those services to Canadians. Federal Environment Minister Stephen Guibault says there's a lot of disagreement at the UN Biodiversity Conference taking place in Montreal. He says many countries are not in agreement but says consensus is still possible at COP15 which wraps up on Monday. I know we have it in us to work together to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. And Canada is here to help make that happen, to bring nations together to support an ambitious outcome. We are calling on those who want ambition to understand that ambition is tied to resource mobilization. We are asking that countries wanting resource mobilized understand that we can only get there with ambition. As the co-lead on the Global Biodiversity Framework ministerial consultations this week with Egypt COP27, Yasmin Fouad, I'm there on the ground asking parties for collaboration, compromise, and consensus. And I'm doing so with the confidence that consensus is possible. We can come together on the key remaining issues before us. We did it in Paris. We can do it here in Montreal. Do you remember hearing about when U.S. governments would send entertainers like Bob Hope and Marilyn Monroe to entertain the troops? Well, it appears as though the Kremlin is doing something very similar now for Russian soldiers who are fighting in Ukraine. According to our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, Russia is sending in opera singers and circus performers to help boost morale. Well, it's better than uh, for the, the morale of the soldiers who are dying in a war to just bring them home rather than send them clowns and singers and entertainment. Um, this is, a, you know, a crazy development in this already very, very crazy uh, war, senseless war that's being fought with the invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces. Uh, and of course, we're seeing uh, a lot of, of tragic deaths on both sides, including Russian soldiers. So here's an idea. You know, they're telling Russians to send in music musical instruments to volunteer if they are performers to, again, boost the morale of these soldiers by sending entertainment onto the battlefield. Lisa Daftari will also talk about an Oscar-winning actress who was arrested recently for supporting the protests in Iran. She'll have details coming up in the second half of our program. You know, many soccer fans all over the world are celebrating Lionel Messi and Argentina's big World Cup victory over France on Sunday. Argentina won the contest 4-3 on penalty kicks. After the match, some fans said this tournament cements Messi's legacy, who at the age of 35 won the World Cup for the very first time. I think I had like five strokes in the last hour. It was so intense, like so intense. Like I couldn't believe it. But it happens every time. In Argentina, you suffer to win. You don't win easily. You need to suffer first. But Messi deserves it, so... That is a perfect representation of what this beautiful game is. It, it makes you smile, it makes you cry, it makes you laugh, it makes, you, it makes you lose your voice. But it just, at the end of the day, you gotta... That man right there has brought so much joy in my life, and it's just the beautiful game right now. This just adds to his greatness, and we are so lucky. We are so lucky to witness such a special, special human being, and I am very grateful. Congratulations going out to Lionel Messi and Team Argentina. And I bet you it's a lot warmer in Argentina right now. Environment Canada issued an extreme cold warning for our region today here in southwestern Alberta. The icy cold temperatures will be sticking around for most of the week. Full weather details are on deck. The extreme cold warning continues for much of southwestern Alberta. Windchill values around minus 40. Jeanette Roche is in now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, fortunately by Christmas, it will be much milder here in Lethbridge. 
how a warming trend is expected by the weekend. So maybe that's our Christmas gift from Mother Nature. But yes, extreme cold throughout the week into Tuesday, looking at a high only of minus 26. Going to feel more like minus 37 with that wind chill. Up to two centimeters of more snow on Tuesday into Wednesday. A mix of sun and cloud, but minus 27 for the high once again. Minus two, 22 on a Thursday with sunshine. Mix of sun and cloud on Friday. Minus 10. That's going to feel like quite the warm up there and then there we go there's that lovely lovely balmy weather expected for our Christmas weekend one degree only on a Saturday the 24th which is Christmas Eve and then of course Sunday Christmas Day looking at a high of one degree I'm actually looking forward to that you could actually spend some time outside there okay so according to the almanac the average high for this time of year is only zero uh, average low minus 12 to 16 was our high temperature on this day back in 1954 and it was a chilly minus 34 without the wind chill back in 1983. Sun rose this morning at 825, sunset this afternoon at 432, giving us eight hours and only seven minutes of daylight as we are getting closer and closer to that winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. Looking at the west coast, here's something you don't see every day, a winter storm warning in effect for Victoria. Uh, Victoria looking at uh, up to 10 centimeters of snow and blowing snow tomorrow, minus one the high, minus six the high in Vancouver also a snowfall warning in effect for Vancouver looking at uh, five to ten centimeters tonight another five centimeters tomorrow minus 25 the high in Edmonton and minus 27 in Calgary with that extreme cold warning still in effect minus 23 the high in Saskatoon with a mix of sun and cloud Regina nice and sunny but a high of only minus 24 of course with those wind chill values gonna feel much chillier minus 21 the high in Winnipeg Winnipeg seeing uh, periods of light uh, snow tomorrow as well as we get into central Canada, zero, the high for Toronto with partly cloudy skies, mainly overcast in Ottawa with minus 22, the, or minus 22, or minus two rather, the high. I'm so used to seeing those double digits in the minuses. Montreal also looking at a high of minus two tomorrow. Two degrees the high in Fredericton tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud. Periods of rain mixed with snow tomorrow in Halifax and Charlottetown and St. John's. High of three degrees the high in uh, Halifax tomorrow. Three the high in Charlottetown and as high as zero in St. John's and Newfoundland with 60K winds along parts of the coast there. So there you have it, that is your forecast. Today's weather report is brought to you by Ridge Utilities, providing competitive rates for electricity, natural gas and internet while investing back in communities across Southern Alberta. Stats Canada says the number of job vacancies fell in the third quarter after reaching a record high in the second. The agency says employers were actively seeking to fill more than 959,000 vacant positions in the third quarter. Now that is down 3.3% from the April to June period. Job vacancies remain elevated compared with before the pandemic. It says there was an average of 1.1 unemployed persons for each job vacancy in the third quarter of 2022. That compares with an average of 2.3 unemployed people for each job vacancy in the first quarter of 2020. Calgary-based TC Energy says cold weather in the forecast in Kansas may slow efforts to recover oil that spilled from its Keystone pipeline leak nearly two weeks ago. The company says it has recovered more than 72,000 barrels of oil from a creek so far. The spill of 14,000 barrels is the worst leak in the pipeline's history. U.S. safety regulators are urging people to stop driving some older model Dodge and Chrysler vehicles after an exploding Takata airbag inflator killed another driver. Until faulty inflators are replaced, the automaker and the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says people should stop driving Dodge Magnum wagons, Dodge Challenger and Charger muscle cars and Chrysler 300 sedans from 2005 to 2010 model years. The last person killed was driving a 2010 Chrysler 300. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 242 points on the day to finish at 19,200. The Dow was down 162 points to 32,757. The S&P 500 was down 34 on the day to 3817. And the Nasdaq was down 159 points to 10,546. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 90 cents to 75.19 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 75 cents to 585 US. Gold was up a cent 
to 1787.63 US an ounce, and silver was even at 22.99 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $12.05 per bushel, barley's at 9.53, canola's at 19.20, and corn is at $11.35 per bushel. Live cattle were up 23 cents to 155.28. Feeder cattle January contract was down $1.68 to 182.10, and lean hogs were down 8 cents to 85.70. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 73.26 US. Recapping one of our top stories, the Canadian press is reporting that the man suspected of killing five people in a high-rise condo north of Toronto in the community of Vaughan was 73-year-old Francesco Villi. Ontario's Special Investigations Unit is not confirming the name, but says the shooter used a semi-automatic handgun and that police found victims in the units on different floors on Sunday. The SIU says the suspect, who was shot and killed by police, lived in the building. Russian President Vladimir Putin is apparently sending circus performers and opera singers to the front lines in Ukraine to help boost the morale of Russian soldiers. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari will have details for us momentarily. If you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. We'd love to hear from you. There are a number of concerns that China is using video games to influence users, harvest data, and shaping narratives in the online community. Now, to talk about this in more detail and some of the concerns this raises is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, who joins us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, Beijing has barred those under the age of 18 from gaming on weekdays and limited their play to just three hours on weekends. But internationally, it's a whole different ball game with Chinese companies are aggressively expanding their market share. How concerning is this for us here in the West? Yeah, absolutely concerning because we talk about China's sphere of influence. We talk about their ability to um, really penetrate all these different sectors and have influence. So it's not only that they are uh, exporting the technology where they everything is made in China, but now they are the, the, the messaging, the propaganda, the subliminal you know text is all owned by China. So they own our hearts and minds as well, well that, at least for the for the newer generation. So we talk about hard power and soft power. In this case, you talk about hard targets and soft targets. This is absolutely a way for China to make itself known, to control the dialogue. Uh, they are doing this all around the world. We, we always talk about how China goes into impoverished areas, for example, and says, you know what, we will put in your internet lines. But guess what? They own the those internet lines, or we will do X, Y, and Z, but then they own that uh, that influence or that arena. Now, we, they're doing that to the United States and the West. And, you know, these are young kids in Canada, the United States, in Mexico, all in, in our hemisphere that are relying on not only the exact, the technology, the, 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 the hardware, but also the software and these games um, and the shows and the TikTok and the list goes on and on. So uh, it's very important to focus on China as the largest growing threat, uh, and I emphasize growing because there's not much attention paid to this, I will remind you that President Biden had a three and a half hour conversation with China's president not too long ago, and none of this was brought up. The only thing that the, that President Biden walked away with was, we don't think they're going to invade Taiwan, which again, we're not guaranteed. But how about all these different threats that are threatening us on a daily basis? Um, and again, no mention of transparency for COVID, no transparency about their human rights abuses. And again, no transparency about uh, copycat technology, about our military copycat um, you know, issues with them stealing uh, military uh, devices and copying them. And now, of course, uh, the messaging in, in all of this technology that they own. Police authorities in Iran have arrested one of the country's most celebrated actresses, an award-winning actress who was one of the stars of the film, The Salesman. Who was arrested and what happened? Yeah, this is, you know, she's an Oscar-winning actress 
quite iconic. Uh, and she, every time she would appear in award shows in the West, she would even keep her hair covered because she knew the consequences of not representing the Iran's regime in the proper way by wearing her hijab even outside of Iran's borders. Now she's taking a stand. And where on Instagram, she posted a picture of herself with the sign saying Women, Life, Freedom, uh, which is the slogan of this uh, current movement in Iran. Uh, and, and she has been arrested merely for providing support for peaceful protesters. I emphasize this because, you know, where where is the West? Where are the women's march organizers? Where are the so-called champions of women's rights when we are watching women being brutally um, killed, rounded up, raped, abused in Iran, merely for supporting a peaceful uprising. Uh, and again, here is a, a, an example. Not all stories are told over the weekend. The Foreign Desk did a roundup of, of women doctors who have secretly been murdered. Why? Because they were treating the injured protesters who were beaten up on the streets. I mean, it makes no sense to us here in the West. The only thing we can do is support them. And the fact that there's global silence is mind boggling. The only thing we can do is share these stories and tell the stories of the Iran protesters and their revolution. And of course, we're talking about the actress Tarana al -Adusti. Now, Lisa, still with Iran, the Islamic Republic has banned 20 students from entering classes after they participated in the December 7th Students' Day rallies. They were protesting the death of the 22-year-old Kurdish woman, Masa Amini, who was in custody of Tehran's morality police. Yes, you know, um, again, just uh, mind-boggling to think that students in a university, uh, here in the West, we we award and we kind of praise uh, any college students who are willing to think for themselves and to stand up for what is right and social justice movements. And here you have Iran, uh, college students, some of the finest universities across that country who were standing up merely in a peaceful protest and are now banned from attending classes. So their future is now being jeopardized merely for attending peaceful protests. And I will tell you how that number is exponentially higher for students who have not been able to return to class or were rounded up. I will also remind you that in the beginning of this revolution, there was the attack on Sharif University, which is one of, if not the most prestigious science and math university in Iran, where regime forces, you know, uh, kind of broke their way through the uh, college gates. They closed those gates. They didn't allow any of the students to escape the dormitories. They rounded up students in unmarked vans and took them off. And who knows what the fate of those students are? Nobody has followed up. Nobody knows what happens to them. The media certainly can't get access to this information. Uh, so there's obviously a fixation on young people in this revolution, high school students, college students, men and women uh, leading the, the, the revolution and saying all we want are our basic, basic freedoms. Let's turn our attention now to the war in Ukraine. In an effort to boost the morale of Russian soldiers in Ukraine, the Kremlin says it's sending opera singers and circus performers to the front lines. At least I guess it's safe to say the circus act continues. I, you know, <laughs> what's better than uh, for the, the morale of the soldiers who are dying in a war to just bring them home rather than send them clowns and singers and entertainment? Um, this is, a, you know, a crazy development in this already very, very crazy uh, war, senseless war that's being fought with the invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces. Uh, and of course, we're seeing uh, a lot of, of tragic deaths on both sides, including Russian soldiers. So here's an idea, you know, they're telling Russians to send in musical instruments to volunteer if they are performers to, again, boost the morale of these soldiers by sending entertainment onto the battlefield. Veteran U.S. diplomat Henry Kissinger, a man who used to be the Secretary of State under U.S. Presidents Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford and who helped to broker a deal during the Cold War, is calling for a negotiated peace in Ukraine. Lisa Kissinger is 99 years old and still active in foreign dip diplomacy here. Yeah, you know, the probably one of the most experienced uh, statements when it comes to diplomacy and appeasement in a lot of ways, uh, if you look at his record, you know, is is kind of 
speechless when it comes to what can be done about the Russian invasion in Ukraine. He's calling for a ceasefire. He's calling for peace talks. And of course, uh, Russian President Putin is not even listening or is not going to entertain anything that requires him to back down, withdraw, or uh, to issue a ceasefire uh, before sitting down. He wants to win this war. And he's extremely clear about this. So anything that the West is offering, including Zelensky, who has uh, uh, many times said, let's sit down and talk about this. Um, France tried to uh, you know, insert themselves in the United States, of course, sending lots of aid and money to Ukraine and showing, you know, obviously that they support Zelensky in this invasion. Uh, but um, the sanctions, the pressure, nothing has worked. So, um, you know, uh, there are, are, are many leaders across the world that are calling for not just a ceasefire, but to sit down and have uh, talks to broker some sort of peace, uh, in, again, in this very senseless war. Lisa, officials in North Korea say they conducted a very important final stage test for the development of a reconnaissance satellite. Now, that was the day after its neighboring country said that North Korea launched two ballistic missiles toward the Sea of Japan. Right. So Japan is getting very nervous about these developments in North Korea. The West not paying so much attention, particularly the Biden White House has not mentioned nor the North Korean threat in a very long time. But meanwhile, Kim Jong-un knows that he is playing out the clock with the Biden administration, doing whatever they can announcing different missile tests every day. As you mentioned, this is a final test. That means there have been several series uh, in, in this latest uh, development. And uh, again, we see South Korea, Japan getting very nervous in that part of the world, uh, watching North Korea expand its power and to, to make these very bold announcements with their missile tests. We don't know what will be next, but of course, this is something to keep an eye on in terms of, of, of its development. Here's an interesting holiday story. A man who was overheard yelling, Allahu Akbar, has been accused of cutting down a Christmas tree installed by a French town hall earlier this week, and he was subsequently arrested by police. This is, it's crazy. A 39-year-old man out in the outskirts of Bordeaux, France, says Allahu Akbar, cuts down a tree, um, a Christmas tree, obviously a symbolic hit on Christianity uh, by an Islamist extremist. Uh, we've seen a lot of these stories, particularly in France. If you remember years back, there was a car ramming in a, in a, in a Christmas marketplace. Uh, there have been many attacks on Christians in this part of the world. You know, they kind of exported the, the war on Christians from the Middle East now into Europe. If you're following the news, you know, uh, Christianity has been you know, under persecution in many parts of the Middle East. The foreign has actually had a, an annual campaign called My Freedom uh, instead of My Freedom, where we would post Christmas trees from around the world, particularly in Africa and uh, the Middle East, where Christianity is forbidden. The practice of Christmas, the celebration of Christmas is forbidden because of this fixation by extremists um, to cancel Christmas. Uh, so imagine in places like Iran or Sudan and, and uh, other parts of the Middle East, least, they would have to smuggle Christmas trees while they were vacationing in other parts of the world in their suitcases and then put it up and then secretly put it up because if it would be confiscated, uh, there would be a jail time for practicing Christianity, which is forbidden in many parts of the world. So here is a very open attack on Christianity. I know it looks like a little side story, but it is in fact an attack on Christians, on Christianity, on Christmas, uh, and, and a very important story. As long as we don't forget that Christ is the reason for the season, that we celebrate Christmas here. Lisa, closer to home, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security says more migrants may be released into the United States to pursue immigration cases when the Trump-era asylum restrictions end. Tell me more. Yeah, so this is an end of Title 42, which will end on Wednesday. It will expire. This is uh, a legal um, aid that was put into place by the Trump administration in March of 2020 to slow the flow of, of migrants into the country because of COVID. Uh, it was done actually in the 40s to slow the spread of influenza and again used uh, as a measure by the Trump administration to slow uh, COVID coming into the country. And the Biden administration actually extended it till now, which will expire on, on Wednesday. Now imagine the number of migrants we have coming into the, the country 
daily, and that's with this measure in place. Now imagine when this measure expires on Wednesday, what influx we are expecting, and, and how you and I have spoken about you know, this domino effect coming in from countries like Guatemala and Venezuela and Ecuador and other places into Mexico, so they're not just from Mexico, and then coming into the country, and more recently trickling uh, further north into Canada as well. So it is something that is affecting the entire hemisphere, uh, and it will continue to be uh, to exacerbate uh, because of the numbers. And again, because of this protection, this legal protection being removed, they are expecting a huge influx and, and growth in numbers uh, from our southern border. She's one of our regular contributors, Lisa Daftari of the Foreign Desk. Thanks so much for joining us today from Los Angeles. My pleasure. The Alberta government introduced Bill 1, otherwise known as the Alberta Sovereignty within the United Canada Act. Now, since introducing the bill, there's been a lot of backlash, especially from Rachel Notley and the NDP who say it's bad for business. Now, to talk about the act in more detail is Alberta Deputy Premier and Infrastructure Minister Nathan Newdorf, who's also the MLA for Lethbridge East, and he joins us from Lethbridge. Nathan, welcome back to BCN. Great to be here, Al. Thanks for having me. You bet. Now, Nathan, explain exactly what the Alberta Sovereignty Act is all about and why you think a number of Albertans maybe take issue with it. Sure. I think it's uh, misunderstood, obviously, very political in terms of the response from the NDP. But it, what people really need to realize are a couple things. One, this is not about Alberta separating from Canada. That's why we changed the name within a United Canada. That's a very important piece for many people. Albertans are very proud to be Canadian and we want to be a contributing partner to the Confederation. That's one big thing. The second is a lot of people don't understand what it does in function. Now, one of the ways I have always described it as this protects Alberta's constitutional rights. When, when Canada was founded, there was constitutional jurisdiction governance given to provinces and to the federal government to run in parallel. And what we've seen uh, uh, quite a number of times over the past few years, more and more so recently, is the federal government infringing upon the provincial jurisdiction of that governance. So we like to call the, the Sovereignty Act or the Alberta Sovereignty within the United Canada Act, it's a shield legislation. In one thing, it does, it does nothing. It's not active. It doesn't direct people to do things. It's a shield to say, here's a line in the sand clearly identifying what are provincial jurisdictional rights and what are federal jurisdictional rights. When the federal government makes a proclamation or makes a law or does something to transgress that line, the Sovereignty Act then allows our government to respond either with a legal change or a regulatory change or in some way to protect our citizens from that overreach of the federal government. But as it is written right now, it is strictly a shield, a framework to help protect the interests of Albertans within a United Canada. And I guess that would include mineral rights as well, right? Yeah, that's one of the jurisdictions. Our, our whole energy sector is that, uh, our agricultural sector, the application of our health care is a provincial jurisdiction. Our uh, advanced education system is one of those areas. Those are responsibilities given to the province to enact on the people within their borders. And while the federal government can be a partner, they cannot dictate it. Dictate it. So uh, you have your household, Hal. I have my household. If I was to come over to your house and tell you how to cook your food and uh, decorate your house and when to go to bed, I think you'd take umbrage with that. That's not my jurisdiction. Your house is your jurisdiction. My house is my jurisdiction. This is the same thing on a government level. But I wouldn't mind you coming over cooking a meal every now and then. That wouldn't be too bad. Now, sure, I look forward to that. <laughs> now, Nathan, what are some <laughs> of the actual amendments that have been made to Bill 1? We made two specific amendments. One was to more comprehensively define the word harm. What did it mean for the federal government to uh, inflict harm upon the province? So we, we defined that in two bullet points, and we can get into the technical language, but it, it basically more closely defines what we mean by that uh, for economic harm and other harm so that we limit the range of that application of the Sovereignty Act should it be enforced. And the second was 
to ensure that if the change required by the government of Alberta was a legislated change as opposed to a regulatory change or something else where ministers have that authority, but a legislative change would have to go back to the chamber for all stages of a bill progressing, first reading, second reading, committee of the whole, and third reading, so that in no way, shape, or form would the authority under the Sovereignty Act be given to uh, the Premier and Cabinet without having to come back for that proper due course. So those were the two amendments that we made to that bill. Now, Nathan, the Alberta Treaty Chiefs have allegedly outright rejected the Alberta sovereignty within the United Canada Act. Now, they say their treaty rights lie with the federal and not the provincial government. Why didn't the UCP maybe meet with these chiefs prior to introducing Bill 1? I think there's some confusion uh, of that as well and some timing issues. We, we probably could have done a better job to make sure we more fully explained with them. That would always be our intent. But the, in the treaty language, to my understanding, it is limited, is that uh, in any time that a legislation could impact First Nations and their treaty rights, there is a duty to consult. So some of that may be under the, the understanding what the Sovereignty Act does. In, in my understanding, if it's just a shield and it's not an actionary piece of legislation, because it doesn't technically do anything, it just creates a framework within to do, which in which to do something, there is not necessarily a duty to consult. I think that would be the legal argument our government would, would make. In the special resolution, how the Sovereignty Act comes out to play, if that special resolution has an impact on treaty rights and our First Nations, that duty consult would happen at that point in time before that resolution could come forward. I think there's some uh, confusion there. There may be some more uh, conversations that need are required to have to, to talk that through. I think that was our understanding. And we, I look forward to the Premier, the Minister of Indigenous Relations, and our entire government continuing to have those conversations with our First Nations partners and more, more clearly identify those areas so we don't transgress any of their treaty rights. Okay, let's talk about inflation now and the rising cost of living, especially the carbon tax increases have impacted so many people here in our province, including our farmers. A lot of that's attributed to the Trudeau Liberals. We hear that from the CPC all the time in Pierre Polyev. But what is your government doing specifically, the provincial government, to help make life a little more affordable for Albertans? Well, thanks for asking, How we, we have recently just passed our Bill 2 uh, for, to help with the, that cost of living. And it has a number of pieces in it, things that affect a very, very broad range. I think one economist in Alberta said 98% of Albertans will have a direct benefit from, from this passing. There is the fuel tax relief program that uh, for six months, there'll be no provincial fuel tax at the price of the pumps that will help all Albertans that drive. There's an electricity rebate, which has already provided up to $250 of relief. Uh, to 1.9 million families, small businesses and farms. Uh, so that's a great piece for anybody paying for electricity. There's a natural gas rebate. Uh, there's additional money coming for the utilities. We are re-indexing AISH, PDD, income support, seniors benefit, child tax and family benefits, and your personal income tax. Uh, there will be targeted payments for families with children under 18, uh, targeted payments to seniors 65 and up, and all of the vulnerable Albertans. So that's another huge segment. So we really wanted to try to target those who are most vulnerable and get the care and support to those who needed it most. And in a broad measure, we've, we've really hit a, a large number of Albertans. Now, health care will be a hot button issue heading into next May's provincial election. There's still a severe doctor shortage in many parts of the province, even in our region here. And now it appears as though our children's hospitals are being overrun. So what's your government doing to address these very serious concerns? Sure, the, the Minister of Health is working overtime on this file, uh, meeting with, with many members all across the province and Alberta Health Services, their management. Of course, we're, we're seeking to make more uh, direct changes to health care. Uh, one, one of the factors that is really uh, putting a lot of uh, pressure on the system was for a long period of time, there is a shortage of cold and flu medication for children. Our Alberta Health Services has been able to secure 5 million bottles of that, which is significant 
the federal government was able to only secure 1 million for the entire country. So we'll be helping out in that measure. Uh, we have hired through our primary care network, 17 new doctors, family doctors for Lethbridge. We are still waiting for many of them to come to Lethbridge and set up practice. Uh, that can take some time. I believe there are three doctors now in Lethbridge that are receiving patients uh, and that they'll be filling up very quickly. There is a lot of demand. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our frontline workers, our doctors, our nurses, our practitioners, our LPNs. They are working an incredible amount trying to keep you safe and healthy through this winter season. Nathan, the AHS recently said that 17 of the 20 ICU beds in Lethbridge have been taken up mainly due to those who are battling influenza. Have you ever sat down with Health Minister Jason Copping and say, why do we only have 20 ICU beds at the Chinook Regional Hospital when there's over 100,000 people here? You know, I look at places like Montana, they have over 100 ICU beds, you know, and in different cities there are different quadrants. So why so few ICU beds? A lot of people are wondering. Sure, that, that's been a challenge through COVID. We, we really face that. But I think in my talking, not only with the health minister, but people who work in, uh, in health care, is that our system wasn't set up for uh, intensive care being the capture point. We've really tried to set our health care system up for people to meet the frontline servicers, whether it be their family doctor or uh, another care practitioner, early on to try to manage that so that the intensive care unit is truly for that. Obviously the goal would be to have as few people there as possible. We know we need it for emergencies and extreme situations, but that's not where you want to care for people for any long period of time. Uh, there's, there's other care systems where it, once their situation is stabilized, we can get them into long-term care beds or there's many points in the system before that where you want to try to intercept that person for the best care possible. Uh, intensive care is, is very specific for a very specific period of time. And that's why uh, having too many beds is a, a cost to the system that's not regularly being utilized or during a pandemic, that is definitely a strain, but we wanna find um, other places for them to receive the care that they need. The latest abacus poll has the NDP leading the UCP 33 to 35% support. But Nathan, there are also 25% of Albertans who are simply undecided. What will your party do to kind of shore up that support between now and May? We are continuing to show them that we are capable, we are competent, and we care. Those are really the driving forces of our government. We are doing everything we can to protect them, their well-being, their health and make the changes that they need to get the service that they want. I will also point out that the trend of the polling over the last month or so has definitely, uh, we've gained 12 to 14 points depending on the poll that you look at. We are starting to uh, come together again. I think there was some turbulence with the leadership race. People weren't sure who we were, or what we were for. We are beginning to answer those questions. We're beginning to gain momentum and we're beginning to show them what we are capable of and how we can do it. Uh, I've never been more excited to be a United Conservative with my colleagues and make the changes that Albertans expect and provide the good government that they expect right across the spectrum of ministries. Let's circle back to healthcare for just a moment and talk about the new cancer treatment center, which I believe is opening in 2024 in Calgary. And it's what, over $2 billion project that you handed over to the AHS. Let's talk a bit about that. Yeah, this is just a fantastic uh, treatment facility that will take some time to populate as there's over 2 million square feet of space to move beds and equipment and materials into, not to mention the fact there's a lot of staff that will have to move from their current cancer center to this one and be oriented. Believe me, I was there for a couple of hours and without a guide, I would have been lost. It is just an enormous space. It is a beautiful, beautiful building with uh, direct sunlight into nearly every single room, be it a patient or a, a, a team room. And it's just really, really beautiful in the heart of the city. It has the, the most advanced technology available. It will really make a difference in people's lives. And when you consider that every, out of every single Albertan, one in two will likely experience cancer in their lifetime. Uh, this kind of resource should bring tremendous hope to many, many people all across Alberta because it will definitely save lives. 
Nathan, the province recently announced that the twinning of Highway 3 is finally coming to fruition. Many would agree that the project is not only important for saving lives, twinning the highway, but it'll also be a huge benefit for our region economically. Can you talk about both points? For sure. Yeah, the first, the first part definitely is safety. Uh, when you have single lane highway with a lot of farm equipment, with a lot of uh, heavy trucks transporting things, sometimes we can be a little impatient with driving and then you seek to pass. It does have some twists and turns and curves. It's got some uh, passing lanes, but we just want that safety aspect to be all the way through from end to end. So that's a big motivating uh, factor there, as well as the economic benefit. We have uh, a huge agricultural community down here in the south and getting those, those crops to the manufacturers here in Lethbridge or other facilities in and around Southern Alberta, doing so safely, doing so in a manner that they know that their drivers and their workers are in the best place possible to not only get it to the manufacturers, but back to the farm, back home, as well as to our rail yards across the border, to other shipping venues. This is a, a real driver to say that our government has invested in agriculture in the south in a very meaningful way for those two points, like you said, safety and economic benefit. A large part of our economy here in southwestern Alberta is based on agriculture. What plans does your government have moving forward in 2023 to really help our farmers and producers? Sure. Uh, after reaching some incredible investment and job creation targets ahead of schedule in our agri-food investment and growth strategy, the Ministry of Agriculture will be introducing a new competitive agri-food value-added processing and manufacturing program that will make Alberta even more competitive uh, with the jurisdictions that we compete against. I think we've got a couple of very strong neighbours and we love working with them wherever we can, but there is some competition. I think good competition is good for business. So this is helping us uh, take another step in that direction. We want to reduce red tape, make it easier for that sector to do business. Uh, we want to evaluate the best options to for those new incentive programs. And our goal is to make sure that our producers have everything they need to grow their product have it produced and get it to market. So I'm really excited about what the future holds in that regard. Nathan, homelessness and the opioid crisis continue to rage on here in our city. What's the province really doing and what capacity working with the city of Lethbridge to address a lot of these issues? Yeah, this continues to be a challenge and a significant partnership that our province has embarked on is what we call uh, intergovernmental health table. So that's provincial government representatives, including myself from the region as, as vice chair, the city, the blood tribe health, uh, uh, health services, and the blood tribe members of the, the blood tribe. So we can attack these issues in a collaborative way, in a way that understands and works with uh, reconciliation with our First Nations and works with multi levels of government, not just for funding, but also for initiatives and directives. I think that's one of the most helpful communicative tools governing bodies that we can start to help address this issue. Uh, the Affordable Housing Partnership Program is another step where, where we recently announced $55 million over three years to support afford affordable housing. Uh, as well as before that, we had $187 million to expand support for homeless Albertans through, uh, through those facing mental health and addictions. Alberta Deputy Premier and Infrastructure Minister Nathan Newdorf, thanks so much for your time today. You bet. Thanks very much, Hal. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks for watching.